difficulty there is you've got three options in terms of because life is going to go on without you you are not indispensable you are a political force that is still for me this is the leadership's thinking so we've got three options the first option is we abstain we don't do anything we reject the DA we don't think the DA carries solutions for our people or for this country it doesn't but we also think that politically it is at the forefront of disrupting a project of confronting racism. Because when you want to confront racism, the DA is the first people to talk about the rights of white people to express themselves. <laughs> uh, freedom and liberalism. So we'll come back to that already. So there we are. The easy decision is to abstain. But if we abstain, the ANC will be back to power. What is it that we are rejecting actually about the ANC? At a fundamental level, you are <coughs> you will be wrong to think the ANC has not been actually the best protector of white monopoly capital in the last 22 years. Has there been the DA? Yeah. The people who protect who killed workers in Marigana in defense of white capital, it was not the DA. So they are both in agreement about this protection. It doesn't matter who you have in relation to the protection of property relations in as far as they benefit continuously the white population. Secondly, the DA and the ANC believe in your liberalism. They, their policies, both of them, both of them, the National Development Plan. It's about who can implement it better. But here is where they differ. The NC Comrades is a gangster party. <laughs> that is what is the reality. <laughs> you have no idea the amount of corruption which relates to the question of the RDPs. In the ANC to be anything, you have to be corrupt. Mm. To go anywhere, you have to be corrupt. There is no amount of self-righteousness that can save the agency. <laughs> it has normalized stealing. They promote each other on the basis of stealing. They celebrate each other on the basis of stealing. It is really, really corrupt. So what were we doing at a local government level? We were not giving the country to the DA. We're removing in excess of 20 billion rents from the hands of the ANC. There are two lessons there. Our people need to know that life can go on without the ANC. <laughs> Number two, we are putting it in the hands of the DA. We didn't take any positions. We didn't take any positions with them. We're not in a coalition with them. I kept correcting that. Um, celebrity Minister of Finance. <laughs> we vote, the electoral system works in this way. We vote all the time in Parliament on issue by issue basis. Okay? We can, for instance, the other time they all voted against us in relation to the amendment of the Constitution to allow the expropriation. DA and the ANC voted together. Mm -hmm. But they are not governing together. Governing together would mean we are pursuing the same policies. You understand? So, putting the DA, you need to disabuse yourself from thinking there is a difference ideologically and in character between the DA and the ANC. The DA as people who have maybe their own money enough not to steal public resources. And when they do steal public resources, I don't know, I don't know. Their record across municipalities, their records across municipalities is much better than that of the ANC. It is not a solution, comrades. If we abstain, the, the DA remains, the ANC remains. If we vote for the ANC, which is the second option, you are retaining what the democratic ballot just removed. 
You are saying to our people, no, 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 take back the ANC. They just told you through a popular vote. But they've also voted the DA more than they voted you. You check the actual vote. There are only 9 million white people. Maybe they, they go to like 9, 10% of the voter population. The DA cannot get 27% only with the white vote. So there's something we need to confront about each other. <laughs> What you must celebrate is that we didn't take any positions. We didn't, we didn't think we can co-govern uh, with people who believe in the protection of property rights. We were not doing that. So we gave them and we challenged them every day. Every day we fight with them from the opposition benches. We are taking time. We are building this baby. We have to make sure that our people have confidence in it. It's going to to ferment and our people will finally be able to choose us without us having to co govern with anyone and we can do our business. But that is the, the condition we are in. We have to be mature. So you can imagine what were my arguments in the CCT. But that's the position now. That's how democracy works. Now, let's deal with... I, I didn't... Um, Simone... Simone? I didn't also talk about people with disabilities. You know, I didn't also because, and that is not misrecognition. Uh, so I, I, I must distance myself. That you remember, an omission is a rejection. An omission is not a rejection. That's what the national chairperson. Advocate Dalim Bof kept saying, if I didn't mention, it doesn't mean I misrecognize. We believe absolutely in the freedom of sexual expression. Everybody has the choice to choose how they choose. They've got the freedom to choose how they want to be sexual. We have to build non-sexist societies. And we appreciate, you know, let me tell you something that is, that is much more dangerous about the condition of women in South Africa. I, I insist. I used to be the spokesperson of BDS. And every time I go to Europe and I talk about apartheid Israel, Zionists will stand and say, but what about Libya? Why don't you talk about why don't you condemn the human rights in Zimbabwe? But I'm talking about apartheid Israel. <laughs> you, can, you can talk about Libya. No one is talking. <laughs> the struggle that at that moment is being conversed about. Yeah. So yeah. I appreciate the second part of the challenge, that is what is our position on that? Let me tell you, the women's bodies are the most violated bodies in this country. The women bodies, the women bodies, whether they are transgender, or, but women, even if they are lesbian, the, the women, because of the virility of masculinity, they are the ones that are banned, they are the ones that are most, who suffer the most from the taboo. The research is all out there. If they choose not to be heterosexual, if I as a man choose not to be heterosexual, and you can see in the struggle of, 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 of rights in the United States, once it was led by those men who are gay, the rights were properly recognized as quick as possible. But it took a very long time for this modernity to just give women the right to vote. Just the right to vote. So I placed emphasis, but that is not reject that transgender people, but also people who choose different forms of sexual expression, whoever they are, they get harassed in our community. That is not to reject that particular reality. It is to mainly highlight that women 
have been killed. Women, women. The two things that happened to, 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 to the native spirituality uh, and which is linked to the decolonization of the mind. You will never be able to save a person who believes in the main. You will never be able to save a person who believes uh, in a white Jesus. Né? You will never be able to save them from self-hatred. The first thing that they need to disabuse themselves from is the idea of a white God, or a God that has color. And that is deep in all our psychologies. Because we grew up with Santa Claus. We grew up every day. Well, when you close your eyes and you say, Our Father, you are imagining an old white man. <laughs> But there's something else that happens. So there is a reality of how in religion, racism was intertwined to the very religious practice that colonized us. But something else as well happened. There was a demonization of the spiritualities that were found in the continent. And those forms of demonization at the moment are sustained not by white people, they are sustained by black people. If you become a Sangoma or a Nyam, if before an exam you go home, Mushabi, in Buzi, and all, do all of that, you get to be looked at as if you are disrupting the space, like it's the Sangoma. How is it to be a Sangoma in a university? It's like it's to be something different. But others are running, they are not asked, how is it to be a Sangoma? <laughs> massive amounts of work within Christianity itself that have been done by black theology to, to sort of make Christianity itself and Islam and in some instances African religion itself uh, or African forms of spirituality to disabuse themselves from gender violence, from gender oppression and you have to appreciate the forms of spirituality that existed in the continent. Because the, the gods can as well be female. You can, you can be a guy that can be possessed by a female spirit, not possessed in a negative sense, and be guided and taken over by a female spirit, by Ugo or Uma, and be able to administer the spiritual healing for our people. That's what's nice about what was happening in the continent. Also that cosmologically, you don't imagine God up there, solutions that come from the sky. Yeah. That cosmologically we imagine it differently. And, and, and I think that uh, that particular work, that it, it has been done. There's real work that has been done in that space. We just need to familiarize ourselves with it. Comrades, we're not going to expropriate everything without compensation. That is not our proposition. We are looking into the land, but we also set banks and mines. I didn't mention them because of time, but that, is, that, that does not mean we are not going to do them. So it's an omission, it's not a rejection. We go that far because we are not going to expropriate um, uh, factories. Something different has to happen there. Two things that we put, if you read the founding manifesto of the EFF, I'm going to link that to the question of socialism. What is socialism? Many people think socialism is us looking the same. We, we all wear the same clothes, you know, and then all of that. And we count the food. No. A, a more modern idea. Socialism is a much more modern idea of economics, actually. It's a much more advanced idea of economics, of the relationship between producing and consuming. 
is that we have to do that activity without, we have to do it not for profit, but for people. You have to dismantle production for profit and profit maximization. If things are done for profit, we waste. Karl Marx proves it that you do what is called overproduction. And that's why the crisis of capitalism over and over again it is the crisis of overproduction. Because capitalists driven by greed compete over a single product as to who can produce it better. But if we produce for people, that is the real organization. You can imagine immediately from their flows a realization between the relationship of producing and consuming. The relationship between producing and distributing. You have to dismantle the idea of being driven by profit or profit maximization. We have to produce. That's what the definition of socialism means. Now, when we have taken the land, we say that in the founding manifesto, the act, it, it is going to be common property. <laughs> Distributing it for settlement. So we have to do a proper plan of those settlements. And I give all the time a typical example. Behind Alexander is a huge property which is owned by some people and the people have been refused to expand to that property. When we have taken the land, we are going to move our people, allow Alexander to breathe and expand without paying for that property. That is what it means. So already, you are not going to start from scratch. Already the demands of land are there. And then we have to do a proper agrarian plan. Agrarian plan that has to do with breaking up the farms into small scale farming. Link them immediately to the shelves. In South Africa, the most important thing is the shelf. You know, if you do business now, yeah? If you, you can engage in your own business, you invent a new cell phone, we give you a loan, I'll come back to the loan, and you produce the cell phone. One of the most difficult things to get is a shelf. It's the distributors. The distributors speak only to big monopoly industries. If you do bread now, it will be difficult to put it on the shelves of pick and pay. Because on the shelves of pick and pay are only three brands. And they internally produced bread. So one of the things that we need to free are the shelves in game, in pick and pay, at gas, all those chain stores is to free the shelves. There's a complicated process there that they engage in to deny the introduction of new products into the economy. So you link all those small scale farmers to the shelves so that they are actually feeding us into the economy so that at the shelves there we are buying their food. This comes to the global economy. You know, comrades, one of the biggest scare things that we need to disabuse ourselves from is that those things of locally producing our food and our products are anti-capitalist or are disrupt. That's how everybody else does it in the world. The new Trump policies are a return to what America did when it started industrializing in the 1800s. High tariffs to protect infant, what they called, they are the inventors of the term, by the way, to protect infant industries from international competition. So that they're able to grow up and be on their feet. They protect them how they make everything from outside super expensive. So that you buy from them in the country. Americans themselves did. So what you are asking is, you have to redirect the resources and the capital, both in the banks as well as in investment companies, into production that is happening within the country. And then on those products that we are building ourselves locally from, we have to protect them from competition. That is the path that led China to where it is. That is the path that led, in fact, the entire East Asian economies. It's protectionism. Here, Tabombebi opened the country, opened the borders. For, he said that's how investments are going to come. What came? It's not investment, it's products. That replaced everything that we had been locally producing. 
and people lost jobs because <laughs> local factories closed shop because there were cheap goods in the shelves. So you have to raise the, the tariffs, make sure that in those chosen products that we are beginning to do, we protect infant industries. That's how you interact with global capitalism. But finally, socialism is not an isolated project of South Africa only. As Karl Marx said, workers of the world must unite. A truly socialist economy is where the workers themselves are the producers. It's where the workers themselves own their means of production, which means workers need to disabuse from themselves from something called the wage. They have to disabuse themselves. I don't know when we are going to get there, comrades. It's a very long day. We have to, we have to build a producer consciousness out of all of us that we are producing for ourselves. This is our fate, and we are able to democratically conduct their own affairs and also make sure that they, at all times, improve their technologies. So it is very positive. It's not an anti, you know, like outside modernity project. Socialism is very modern. It's modernity. It's as modern as it comes. But what it does is that it's, it's the perfect solution to capitalism that no, what is making the exploitative dangers of capitalism is the pursuit of the maximization of profit. But that doesn't solve problems. It doesn't solve all problems. You still have to deal with xenophobia. You still... Yeah, yeah. Coming with yeah, yeah. socialism doesn't do away with sexism. It doesn't do away with patriarchy. Particularly, it's violent forms. So I'm not saying to you, when we have socialism, ah, men will be willing to enter into a polygamous relationship where the woman is the only, is the person. You understand where everybody is married to. It used to happen in the continent. Today it's unimaginable because they are going to feel her. So, those problems will not be solved by socialism. We'll have to do other forms of liberatory work. And then, there was a question, comrades, to building a decolonized institution. I assume it's the university. Let me tell you, you know that the Fismaspor was the most brilliant movement. I, I celebrate Fismaspor. I, I am envious of Fismaspor. Yes. You know, in a, in a huge way, comrades, we have to commend that movement. You know, we have to commend it because of two things. First, they made the most powerful argument. Universities have to be free. That's the, that's the first task to decolonize universities. They must be free. There's no decolonized university that still has tuition. No. Decolonizing a university begins with it being free. But then there's decolonization of the curriculum content. Mm. Me and uh, Dr. Noazir mm. Mishaba used to be part of the Department of Politics and Affairs. And all the time we used to argue, no, you need to change the curriculum content. We quickly realized that the people who are teaching at the moment are not the ones that are going to change the curriculum content. They can't teach what they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you want them to teach you things that they didn't study? <laughs> <laughs> How that they don't know those things? <laughs> so it's going to be a situation of we are all learning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, teach us for non. You want Max Price to teach you for non. Oh, Max uh, Price. Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey. No, no, comrades. Decolonization of curriculum content has to do with all of you taking a decision to do postgraduate studies yeah. and to write mm. those dissertations yeah. that are going to substitute. There we can, substitution of content is fine, not of human beings. <laughs> that is going to replace the content that is being fed to us today. You have to take on the, the task of being <coughs> academics yourselves. And whilst I'm at it, South African blacks are not taking up post-colonial studies. You are too quick to go and solve those problems of poverty at home. And let me tell you, they've been existing long before you were born. You can't solve them through individual acts. 
We have to engage in a social collective struggle that requires you guys to choose the year of being academics. Many people withdrew from the university. They went to pay and help their brothers and sisters, their mother, after 20 years. After 20 years. Of, and I know that because I spent 10 full years non-stop full time as a student. So I saw many generations, you can imagine, 10 years in the university. Every generation in the university is three years gone, three years gone, three years gone. <laughs> My generation. Smart. Smart people who choose, no, 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 hey, I'm going to go work in a factory to be an engineer because they're going to pay me higher than staying and waging the battle of transforming knowledge. As they do that engineering, as they do that medicine, they are met with the worst forms of colonial oppression. They are in service. They are in the worst service of masters. And they complain every day. The best people who complain about racism are the professionals in South Africa in the trial section. So, I'm not saying don't go be an accountant. I'm saying if you leave the university without accounting professors, and those professors must take a decision at this age that you're going to be a professor. Hey, professorship is a, is a good job. How many you're always in an environment like this? Of young people with energy. It's the fountain of youth. <laughs> professorship is the fountain of youth. <laughs> you know why? Because those who stop learning are old, whether at 20 or at 80. Those who keep learning stay down. Mm. So, please, you must love the career of being professors. We need professors. Okay, comrades? We need professors. That's how we're going to transform these institutions. Finally, wow. the final question which I jumped is how is the EFF going to resist being trapped in the godlike character of presidentialisms. We subscribe absolutely to the limitation of term of office. The, the quickest and most practical way to solve that problem of Robert Mugabe, Idi Amin, Mabutu Sesel is that actually after two terms you're no longer president. You don't care. Take two terms, you're out. So, and I like, because we, we, we have one of the best activist of our generation in Julius Malema. You know? This country would still be in sleep. This country would still be in sleep. The CIC and the deputy president of the EFF, if you understand the history of politics in this country, they are to this generation what Anton Lembede and A. Pinda were to the generation of 1974. <laughs> that fire, that fire is not their fire, it's our fire. It is our fight. The second thing that we do, which is very, very by proper, proper, we, we can't dispense with democracy governments. Never come to a situation where people are telling you, no, democracy is an African. No, 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 that is not true. That is not true. The people always have to be given a voice to inform the things that run their lives. And we must always be rooted in consultation and accountability. As long as the, the EFF is rooted in branches like university communities, the villages, the townships, as long as its membership is an active membership, then it will not go wrong. The day the ANC lost it is when it corrupted its branches. The most corrupt thing in the ANC, by the way, it's the branch, because it's the branch that gives us a council who sells RTP houses. So already, at the, at the level of the community branch, the ANC is corrupt. 
every every council of the ANC you meet is not serious about people. They, they are they're trying to, to see how to make money for themselves. They are trying to see how to make money for themselves. So when we have become like that, those threats are not. Those threats face us as well. They, they do not face us. We can't say we are immune to them just because we wear threats. The reality is they face us as well. And we have to do a constant practice of democracy. The day we do not do that, of holding each other accountable, of a mandate and reports all the time, the very activity of coming here and being asked hard questions, not only about the quality of policies, but also about our actions in Parliament, our actions in relation to the DA. The day leadership doesn't do that, comes with a helicopter here, does a speech, you clap hands and I go. You have to be very worried. So that democratic praxis is what is always going to help us, but it must be based, comrades, in the mass work that we do in the everyday. So I must, uh, I must take a bite at, at, the, at the incoming SRC. One of the biggest traps of the very SRC, the biggest threat, I agree you have removed was it Safko? Yes. No, that's a, that's a, that is better. <laughs> but you're going to be faced with the same problems that they faced. Just because you are here doesn't mean you're not going to be faced with the same problems. When you enter in that SRC, I have a very simple advice for you. Very practical, simple advice for you. SRCs are in a way forms of recruiting you into a false equality. Never forget. Never in your life, when you are in council, in the Senate, never think you are equal to those people. They are in positions of power. What is their essential position of power? They can decide tomorrow who passes and fails. That's the power the teacher has. And then they come and they think, no, we're equal. No, no, we're not equal. I need you to appreciate and hold that position and embrace that position of power. Tomorrow you can decide whether I pass or fail. And that has consequences on my life. The second advice is simple. Once you know your place, never betray the interest of the student. You speak for the student. about the collective interest of the university or uh, 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 about students. Where are the students here? In the state that you are saying. No, no, the students are part uh, uh. <laughs> You have to be fair. You have to always be fair. And let no student go to sleep without food under your watch. Let no student go write exams without food under your watch. There are a lot of students who are not eating in this campus. And they come here, they struggle, they are unable to even say those things. Have the wisdom to recognize and be able to help them. And at all times, let the left hand not know what the right hand is doing. make sure that this campus is safe for women. You have to make sure that this campus is safe for all the women, workers, students. You have to make sure that it is safe. And the question of safety is a non-negotiable question of violence. What you are really making them safe for is the violence that uh, has been normalized because we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to report it. We don't want to say it's a private matter. Once you beat up your girlfriend in your room, that is a public issue. We're going to enter and we're going to resolve you. Yes. A lot of you boys here, a lot of you men here, beat up women. A lot of you. So it has to be the fundamental responsibility and number one duty as well for the incoming SRC to say, not under our watch. I wish you the best comrades and I thank you for your